So we're, we're in a, a, a series called How to Get Along, and, and two weeks ago, first week, we talked about our words. Um, I said we needed to have a family meeting, a family get-together, and we just needed to talk about our words. We need to talk about um, our words, how we use them, how we say them. Um, I said that when we, be, we become more like Jesus when we learn how to get along with other people. Um, and, and that words are powerful. It's not just what we say, it's how we say it, because it's not just a reflection of you, but it's a reflection of your relationship and your faith with Jesus. Last week, we talked about gossip, um, talked about how gossip can weigh us down, it can burden us, it causes cracks and damage in our hull. I talked about barnacles and about how they're really tough to get off of a ship, um, that usually gossip creates more gossip. Gossip always costs us something. Uh, and then one of the things I said at the very end is that gossip dies at a wise person's ears. Um, the truth is, we all want to get along, right? If you want to get along, raise your hand. If you want to get along, raise your hand. Awesome. Everybody in here, raise your hand. We all want to get along. But if we're honest, but if we're honest, there's a lot of people that we just don't like, right? If we're honest, there's a lot of people that we just don't like. A lot of times when we get uh, around groups of people that we don't like, we get conflict. Everybody say conflict. A lot of times when we're around people that we do not like, we get conflict. And a conflict is a struggle or an opposition. Conflict is a struggle or an opposition. Conflict comes to us in the English language from the Latin word conflictus. This, that even sounds like a conflict, doesn't it? It comes from a Latin word conflictus. Um, but, but conflict doesn't even have to be physical Conflict could be ideological. It could be theories. When I think about, about non, non-physical conflict, I think about a courtroom. Have we, have we watched shows like where there's a court involved? Like there's a lot of conflict in a courtroom, is there not? Like there's a, there's a lot of conflict there. And in fact, it's so thick sometimes that you can feel it, right? Conflict can be non-physical. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of conflict, right? There's a lot of different kinds of conflict. There's conflict with other people, and that's what mostly we're going to talk about tonight, is our conflict with other people. Um, but there's, there's also um, conflict with self, right? There's conflict inside of us. That's a different kind of conflict. There's conflict with nature, right? That would be like uh, weather or animals or natural disasters. Like that's, that's, a, that's a conflict. That's a real conflict. There's conflict with society and culture. Right and the world around us. That's a different kind of conflict. Um, there's conflict with our future and conflict with our, our destiny or, or our consequences, really. Um, there's conflict with what's coming down the road toward us to meet us. All different kinds of conflict. But tonight we're gonna talk about conflict with other people. Conflict is everywhere. It's even in Hollywood, right? Conflict makes the best movies. That's why we go. Right, if there is no conflict, there's not really an exciting movie. I thought about a couple movies. You all know this one, Shrek 2, right? Shrek 2, and there's a moment in Shrek 2, right? If, you, if you're a big Shrek fan, you remember this. There's a moment in Shrek 2 where they've gone to see Princess Fiona's parents, right? And Shrek is trying to get their approval. And there's this scene in the, in the bedroom where like they're going back and forth about being accepted and like getting the blessing and you know, Shrek had all these preconceived notions about what Fiona's parents were gonna say, and she's telling him to not be such an ogre, right? Right? Um, uh, there's, there's this one too, Star Wars. There's a lot of conflict in Star Wars, right? On like a number of different levels, and we could totally nerd out and talk about all the different layers of conflict that we find in Star Wars. I'm not going to do that, but there's a couple, Luke and Vader, right? Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader and the conflict between them um, and, and how they are tied together. There's the conflict between the dark side and the force, right? The eternal struggle, this conflict between those two um, larger than life things, the, the rebels and the empire, Conflict there. There's all these different layers of conflict in Star Wars, and that's why they're able to make not just one, but like a lot of good ones, because there's very rarely any movie ever that like the second one's just as good. Do we agree with this? Okay, all right, just wanted to make sure. Um, Then there's this one. So this one may not be a popular one with you, but I love this movie. Such a good movie. 
Such a good movie. But the real conflict, like, there's multiple layers of conflict with this movie because obviously there's the conflict of war like, between Japan and the United States. There's the conflict of war. But here's, here's both guys fall in love with the same girl and their besties. You want to talk about conflict? Yeah, it is, it, is, it is juicy, right? And that's like the whole like two and a half hour movie is him, them trying to work out who gets the girl. Have we seen Pearl Harbor? Have we seen it? Yeah, yeah, it's good. But it is hard to get along. It's hard to get along. Unfortunately, we, you and me, we're really good at conflict. Unfortunately, we're really good at conflict. We're really good at fighting with people. We're really good at fighting with people. We're really good, we're really good at being passive aggressive. Do we understand this concept of passive aggressive? Yes. Um, we're really, really good at ghosting people. When we don't want to be in conflict, we just don't respond. <laughs> um, we're really good at being the center of the drama or beside the drama or in front or behind the drama, but we're around the drama somewhere and the conflict that's there. Nobody likes conflict. Here's what makes conflict so dangerous, though. Do you remember the video, the avalanche video? Here's what makes conflict so dangerous. Conflict has a way of growing from a very, very small snowfall, snow slide, into a large avalanche. Conflict has a way of going from something small to something really big and really dangerous. And on its way downhill, it's gonna scoop up and sweep up everything and anything that's in its path, right? Conflict has the potential to hurt or destroy people's integrity and people's character and people's morality on both sides on both sides. And that, that happens, that happens because people try to gain support for their side and for their perspective, right? Making exaggerated statements about what it is that the other side believes or what they believe or shading the truth or putting down the other side, uh, putting down their motives, right? Most of us can't stand this, but we're so good at it. We're so good at it. We've been reading from Proverbs the last couple of weeks, and it's in Proverbs that will be tonight. But Proverbs is busting at the seams with wisdom about how to get along and about conflict. And, and I personally, I love the straightforward language that we find in Proverbs, right? There's just like one sentence, one little idea about conflict. So let's look at, let's look at a couple of these, all right? I got a couple of points I'm going to share with you. Number one, what we see in Proverbs is that God talks about the importance of listening and seeking first to understand. God talks about the importance of listening and seeking first to understand. Two Proverbs, Proverbs 18, 13. If, if one gives an answer before he hears, before they hear, it is his folly and shame. Proverbs 25, 12, like a gold ring, or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Here's what it says. Here's what Solomon is saying, right? Solomon's saying, we need to get into another person's shoes and not judge or not assume the worst, right? We need to get into other people's shoes and not judge, not assume the worst about them. It's really, really easy to vilify the other side, to make the other side a villain, right? This is what we see in politics, right? Um, I don't know if you follow politics or, at all or not, but and I'm not certainly going to get up here and be political, but this is what we see a lot of the time. If you don't vote for me, then, then this terrible, awful, tragic, ugly thing will happen, right? If you don't vote for my side, if you don't vote for my platform, all of these really dangerous things will happen. These people, they'll take things from you. Or, they'll, or, they'll, or they'll, they'll institute new laws that are awful and terrible, and you don't want that to happen, right? They'll vilify the other side so that they'll get your vote. 
We, we, we have this drama, right? It's not just in politics, but it's in, it's in our schools. It's in conflict at home. It's on our teams or our clubs or where we hang out. And, and, I, and I wonder, and I, I, wanna, I want us to think about this for 10 seconds. How might things change if we paused and considered, look here, I wonder how things might be different. I wonder how things might be different if we stopped and said, what's it like to be on the other side of me? What's it like to be on the other side of me? I think things would probably change, maybe even just a little bit, but I think it'd be worth it if we were to pause before conflict and we were were able to say and have the discipline to stop and say, what's it like? to be on the other side of me. Second thing, Proverbs talks about not being defensive and receiving correction, right? And not to let anger get the best of us. Proverbs 27, 17, an intelligent person learns more from one rebuke than a fool learns from being beaten a hundred times. It's pretty graphic, right? Proverbs 13, 18, someone who will not learn will be poor and disgraced. Anyone who listens to correction is respected. Criticism can absolutely lead to conflict, right? We're in agreement. It's not just me that feels that way. Criticism can lead to conflict. I don't know of anybody who likes criticism. I, I, don't, I don't know anybody who likes criticism. It's, it's hard even to find people who like constructive criticism, right? I remember a few years ago, I had an evaluation um, where I was serving, and, and the, the, the pastor who was evaluating me said, that, that I need to be careful because my type A personality can get me in trouble and that I have a tendency to bulldoze other people. And he said that right there, um, right there across from lunch. And, and at first, that was pretty hard to hear. That was pretty difficult to hear. But then I had to step back and realize that what he was actually trying to do is he was trying to make me a better leader, right? Trying to make me a better youth pastor. Um, He challenged me to see areas where I can be more aware of myself, where, where I can see and spot areas that I can begin to improve upon. And if I was somebody that couldn't accept that correction, there would have been conflict, right? If I was somebody that, that wasn't okay, receiving constructive criticism, that could have been a a certain way to conflict. When somebody, especially somebody who loves you, and you all have people in your life who love you, right? If, if, If somebody, especially somebody who loves you is trying to help you by offering you a critique or a correction, constructive criticism, how do you deal with that? Do you get better or do you get bitter? If somebody's trying to offer you help and trying to show you areas in love where you can grow and get better, do you get better or do you get bitter? Third thing, Proverbs talks about the importance of face-to-face conversations. Um, Proverbs 27, 17, people learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. Anybody heard that before? Iron sharpens iron. Oftentimes in the athletic world, we use that, right? And outside of Proverbs, I thought this was just too good not to pull in Jesus is talking in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. He says this. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I was talking to a group of students on Tuesday night, um, and I I read this verse, and I asked them a little bit about what they thought. Some of you are probably there. Um, I asked them a little bit about what they thought. And afterward, afterward, I had had this this thought that kept coming back to me. And and listen, the way of Jesus, it is different. Okay, the way of Jesus is different. Jesus calls us into a reconfigured way of life. It's different. Jesus calls us into a reconfigured way of life. Outside of Jesus, 
the world says, just tell everybody else about it. And it'll make its way back to the problem. And then it'll just get, it'll get fixed that way. Right? Just go around it. Just don't worry about it. It'll sort itself out. Have you heard that before? Right? Just don't worry about it. It'll work out. Right? Don't be confrontational. Don't be, con- it's rude. Don't be confrontational. But Jesus says, no. He says, you start by going straight to the person, one-on-one, if there's a conflict, and, and, and seek peace. I loved the, the orange the orange that they had to fight for, because I loved that they had to do it one-on-one, right? They didn't go and tell their neighbor. They didn't go tell their mom. They, they didn't go tell their teacher. They had a conversation, and they worked it out, right? Thank goodness, because I really would have hated them to, like, fight right here on the stage. That would be terrible. But they worked it out one-on-one. And, and, then, and then, if it doesn't work out one-on-one, Jesus says, bring a couple people with you. Bring a couple of, of trusted friends or a, or a trusted mediator or a wise person. Bring those people with you. And if they still won't reconcile, then you, just, then you take it before the church. You take it before the church. And, 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 and if that means that you have to let it go, then you have to let them go. Right? You release it. You release it. And you don't keep fighting for a relationship where the person is unwilling to work things out. Right? We often, I think we often read about this, though, and we put ourselves in the shoes of the person who's been offended. Right? We put ourselves, but what if you're on the other side? What if you're on the receiving end of this? If somebody's coming to you and has an issue with you, do you really listen? Do you prayerfully accept what they're trying to tell you? Are you, are you humble? Are you humble? Or do you remember that your identity is in Jesus and not how perfect you're trying to be or how right you're trying to be? It's okay to admit when you're wrong. And if somebody comes to you one-on-one and says, hey, listen, we got to work this out, what's your response? No, I'm right, you're wrong? No. It's okay, let's, let's work this out together. Let's work it out together. We get so worried about what people might think about us if, if we're wrong that, we're, that we try so hard not to be. Right? We get so offended when people say that, that, that you've wronged them that we work so hard to be right. I, I've adopted this phrase the last, I don't know, couple years, and, 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 I, and I try to use it. Maybe I, know, maybe I don't do a great job, um, but I, I, I've tried to adopt it more and more, and, the, and it goes like this. Ready? I could be wrong, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And if I am, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. But I think that and then whatever it is that I need to say. Right? And it leaves me room. And even if it's just in my head, it leaves me room to be wrong and to admit that I'm wrong. Right? It leaves me room to be humble because I used to worry so much about being right that I forgot about being in relationship. I used to worry so much about being right that I, I forgot to be in relationship. Four, let me, let me, let me, let me hold on, let me touch on this real quick. If, if, you, if you're in the dating world, I know some of us aren't in the dating world and that's okay, but if you are, right, or if you're almost there, or if you're there, if you're firmly there, and you have a lot of conflict in your, in your dating world and in your dating life and you find it hard to work things out, I think that's a red flag. <laughs> okay? Okay? I think that that's a problem. And I, and I think it might not be a healthy relationship. Okay? Okay, <laughs> number four, Proverbs talks about misunderstandings and forgiveness. Proverbs 17, nine, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. We read that one last week. Proverbs 28, 13, people who conceal their sins will not prosper. If they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Misunderstandings and forgiveness. I, I love this example of how misunderstandings can happen. I'm gonna read this to you. 
okay? Uh, I'm gonna say the same phrase a lot of times. Same phrase, I'm gonna say it a lot of times. But how I say it is gonna change. You ready? I never said you couldn't do that. 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 Are they different? Yeah, a lot different, right? The inflection and the emphasis and the tone changes the whole meaning of what I said. But I said the same thing. This can happen so often in relationships, right, in friendships, where there's conflict around things, and it can just be a misunderstanding. This happens so often where the things that we say, the words that we choose, and how we say them, it just happens to be a misunderstanding. Now, this doesn't mean that, right, you have to stay friends if if there's just a pattern of conflict, but sometimes it means that if you're in a relationship, you just need to admit that things are a misunderstanding and, and you just say, I'm sorry, right? We need to see if there's a way to find peace in our misunderstandings. Number five, Proverb talks about how keeping God first, keeping God first can give you favor with other people. Proverbs 16, seven, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with them. That'll be pretty fantastic, right? When a man's ways please the Lord, when someone's ways please the Lord, He makes even their enemies to be at peace with them. If you're seeking Jesus, students, leaders, if you're seeking Jesus in everything that you do, Jesus and the fruits of the Spirit, they they, they just come out of you, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Keep God first. And you'll you'll bring love with you, right? Keep God first and you'll bring love with you. Keep God first and you'll bring joy. How many of us, how many of us, if, if we were keeping God first, wouldn't it be awesome that in our relationships and where we struggle and, and the areas of our relationship that we have conflict, if we spent Uh, If we spent time growing closer to Jesus, do you think that bringing some joy with you could help to settle some of that uneasiness? Probably, right? How about gentleness? How about self-control? Keep God first. (laughs) If you're bringing with you drama, right, wherever you go, you, you may need to try to assess who's in the driver's seat there right? Six, Proverbs talks about coming from a place of humility when you're correcting or confronting somebody you're in conflict with. Proverbs 11.2, people who are proud will soon be disgraced. It's wiser to be modest. Proverbs 16.18, pride comes before disaster and arrogance before a fall. Some of us are really quick to point out other people's flaws, right? Some of us are pretty quick to point out other people's flaws. But let's always try prayerfully, honestly, to check our hearts before jumping to confront somebody and give some time to the Holy Spirit to work in our life before you quickly bring something up. It may be time Uh, It may be time that you need. It may be wise to take time before you approach people, right? There's, there's 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 been a quite a few studies done on our body language. We know this. Like our, we, sometimes our, our body language tells things to other people without us even having to use any words, right? Our body language says a lot. Experts say that about half of what you say is in your tone and your body language. How about that? When we do approach somebody about a conflict, 
our body language matters. Our body language and our tone matters. I'm going to prove it to you. You ready? This is, this is my, last, my last thought. A um, couple pictures I have for you. We oh, love pictures of me when I was younger because you all giggle and laugh at them. So I'm going I'm to show you a couple. This is me in high school playing football. I look tough, don't I? That collar makes it like levels me up a little bit. Uh, next one. That's tough too. That's pretty tough. Yeah. Next one. That's pretty tough too, right? Like the mud and everything. That's good. Awkwardly running through the uh, the banner. I was never a really good runner. And then this one. I want to stop at this one, I think. This one. This one. Listen, hey, I'm, I need to ask an apology. I try not to use sports illustrations because I know some of us aren't sports people. But I'm going to beg of your forgiveness to prove a point. Okay? Can you do that? All right. Um, in football, I had a coach in high school. And I feel like... I feel like this coach was paid to say the same thing for every week that we had practice, right? He would say the same thing. And you know what he would say? He would say, the low man wins. The low man wins, right? And, and, and what he was saying was, the lower that you got, the lower that you got, the more leverage you had. Right, the more power you had. So the, the object, the goal as a football player, especially as a lineman, because I, I was one, right? The object was to get as low as I could. As low as I could. And we, and we drilled this. Like there were things that we did in practice in order to prove and in order to practice being low. One of those things is we had like a, like a we call it the shoot, right? And those of you who have played football, you understand what this is. It's like a big fence. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's, it lays like flat, but a couple feet off the ground. And you would, and you would get underneath of it, and then you would fire off, and, and you had to stay low. Otherwise, your helmet would hit the chute, and it would hurt, right? It would ring your bell, is what we called it, right? And, and the point was to stay low. We, we did another drill where we, we were Oklahomas is what we called them, and, and it was you against somebody else. And what you had to do is you had to turn around and you had to fire off, and the lower person typically would drive the other one back. And we did that to practice staying low. Everybody with me? If you're with me, say okay. All right. So, so if you came out of your stance too high, you lost. If you came out of your stance too high, you'd get driven back, and you would lose. Oftentimes, when we're in conflict, and we get ready to come out against somebody else, our tendency is to want to get high for our pride, to prove a point, to be right, so people can see how cool we are or, or, how, or how right we are. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think Solomon ever played football. I don't think Solomon ever played football. But I think what he is trying to tell us is the low person wins. The low person wins. The low person wins. A lot of times we come at conflict way too high. Too much pride, too much confidence, right? I'm the offended one. You offended me. You hurt me. You need to pay for it. You need to apologize. What do they know? What do you know? You don't know about me. I have more experience than they do. People should listen to me. Who do they think they are? Right? We come out too high. And if we came out low, if we came out low, 
What would be the difference? What would be the difference if we were humble? If we were unassuming, if we listened, if we observed, if we paid attention, if we waited, if we listened, if we considered the needs of somebody else before we considered our own, if we committed to face-to-face conversations, right? If we, if we decided that we were gonna receive criticism well, if we committed to not being so offended, how would things change? What if we were the lower person? What if we were the lower person? Guys, remember, the way of Jesus is not easy. It is hard. Jesus invites us. He invites us into a reconfigured way of living. It's different. It doesn't look the same as everything else. It doesn't look the same as everybody else. We want to love other people. We want to get along with other people, not because it makes us a better person, but it does. Not because it gets us brownie points with God. There are no such thing as brownie points with God. We don't, we don't want to get along with people because it makes us holier than other people, because it doesn't. We do it because God loved us first. And because the love and grace, grace that God showed to us before we even knew he was there, we are to show love and grace to other people, even in our conflict. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for tonight, for an opportunity to get together and talk about conflict. And Lord, as we go from this place, and as we go and have conversation with, uh, with friends and with people that we know and some that we don't, God, I pray that you would use this time so that we might become better followers of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Adults.